fortunately, as I was just telling the panelists as they got off, it's a good thing that my presentation lines up with theirs, because it would really be awkward if it didn't. Um, <laughs> so this is the home stretch, right? This is the, this is the last one. Uh, I, I want to briefly tell a story. I, I had to laugh with a presenter yesterday. They were saying how every year we come here, every year we say this is the year that mobile payments will become ubiquitous. And uh, every year we do it again, right? We've been saying it for several years. So um, I, I, I thought that was, that was funny. I mean, it's kind of funny because it's true. But we, we are, as you've heard on the panels, as you've heard on the presentations, we're getting so close. We're getting much closer to mobile payments being ubiquitous. And whether that's through an Apple Pay or a Samsung Pay or Google Pay or even Venmo, you know, a lot of these cashless and digital solutions really are gaining steam. Um, the, the, I think back to my first experience with mobile payments. Um, it was in 2009. We were doing a mobile payment solution for the hospitality solution uh, for that industry. Uh, you know, we were in a live site testing with, uh, you know, mobile I iPhones. We were iOS only. Uh, iPad 2s with 3G. I mean, just really, you, that should set the picture, kind of a, a very sort of cobbled together uh, early attempt at mobile pay. Uh, NCRs continued to iterate on that, right? And we've moved into other verticals. We have other mobile payment solutions. That, of course, includes Android now. That, of course, includes responsive websites, e-commerce, and, and the like. Um, so past that, I just wanted to share that, because I think that you know maybe mobile pay isn't uh, today, uh, maybe it's tomorrow, but um, when we think of mobile payments, I think back then it was very much this, I want to make payments easier. Uh, I want to improve the customer's experience. I want to um, do speed of service. And really, I, I think now as we've gone down this, this road for the last few years, we're really finding more things are now part of mobile payments, right? I mean, there's, there's more value props to mobile payment, like loyalty or, or even knowing the behavior of the customer. So uh, I, I think that a lot of these things sort of feed into ultimate what, what we end up with as you know, true mobile payments and all the other sort of value propositions that will be in there uh, for the consumer. So um, one thing not in dispute, right? And, and you heard it here, we live in a cash credit world. Um, crypto is a distant third, I'd say, right now, when you compare to those two. Uh, but what we, we need to be aware of, just as, as we did before with, say, mobile payments, we need to know that this sort of thing is coming, uh, and it's out there. So if we look at changes in uh, demographics, if we look at changes in acceptance, in innovation, uh, things like crypto, probably not too, not too crazy, um, especially if we tie those with things like mobile payments, right? So when I talk about mobile payments, I, I think we heard some new examples. I'd never heard of that where uh, you can actually have an online transaction and then you'll go and exchange that for cash and actually pay for it. That was pretty cool. Uh, but typically when we think of mobile payments, that's tied to a credit card or stored value card, which is an exchange tied to a credit card. But it's some sort of credit-based transaction, even though we're doing something, we're transacting digitally. Um, there's no reason why crypto can't replace credit on the back end of these mobile payment solutions. So what are some of the things that would be driving that? Um, well, millennials, right? You can't get through a conversation without somebody talking about millennials. So if we look at the millennial market space, 800 million in the US, 60, uh, 600, sorry, uh, 600 billion annual spend, and Accenture says that next year, 2020, 1.4 trillion annual spend, which is about 30% of the retail market. Now that's still a small slice, right? I think we heard what uh, 20 trillion is, is kind of right. So it's still a small slice, uh, but this is, this is a growing segment and um, this is a group that's, that's definitely more um, in line with uh, using things other than cash, uh, 
I, I, I love the story about the checks. I think I write checks only to uh, church and to my kids' pre-K. They do not take anything else other than checks. And it's, um, it's, <laughs> it's just remarkable. And that's about it, right? Because as I work with, with peers and friends and, and we go out and we split tabs and all that, I mean, we're using Venmo. I mean, I'm not writing checks to, to, to any of my friends. So, um, I, I, and I'm by no means a millennial. I'll say that. So um, I, I think it's, it's pretty interesting that if we look at this group as a segment and we look at the affinity for things other than cash, um, that we could start to make an argument that something like crypto could, could easily shift in and, and not be far behind. Um, a couple other notes on millennials. 70% uh, of them use mobile phones to pay. And then 40% uh, of them use universal mobile payment apps, which is a really long way of saying Google Pay or Apple Pay, right? So uh, a, a real affinity established here. The, the other thing that came up this week throughout the sessions, and, and I think it's, it's pretty common, is that millennials don't have credit cards, right? Now, recent data says that's not exactly true. Millennials now have kids, have jobs, have houses, and as their credit scores have improved, they've gone to credit. So that overall, hey, this, this whole generation just doesn't do credit, not exactly true. But what is true about them is that they have a lower tolerance for debt, right? They're still probably carrying some student loans, uh, and they have that affinity for other forms of payment that, that I mentioned. And uh, if you're, you're tired of me talking about millennials or hearing about millennials, we'll talk about Gen Z soon enough, right? They're right around the corner. And I would say that that cohort will probably have a very similar affinity to cashless uh, and digital sort of payments um, going forward. So I have uh, here a map, and if I, if I just for a second go back to 2010. So 2010 uh, was the first transaction that occurred with a cryptocurrency. A guy bought two large pizzas from Papa John's for 10,000 Bitcoin. I don't know if you know what Bitcoins are trading at right now, but in today's value for Bitcoins, those are very, very expensive pizzas. But in the beginning, that was what Bitcoin was meant to be, as a way to transact. Now, Bitcoin has become uh, very much more of something, oh, let me hold on to, I'm really hoping the value of this, this piece is going up. But um, if you look at this heat map, uh, we think back 2010, that's the first time somebody bought something. That's our walk towards crypto as being a way that we can pay for things. Um, this coinmap.org uh, map, heat map, it's a snapshot. And we have just what, just over 15,000. These are small businesses globally that will accept some form of cryptocurrency as payment. Uh, if you go to uh, spendbitcoin.com, which I don't have a screenshot, they didn't have a nice pretty map. But if you go there, they say that the number of merchants is closer to 100,000. I'd say the delta is probably between small business and probably medium and, and large tier businesses globally. But either way, if you look at those numbers, uh, nine years ago, we were at zero, right? So this is, this is a pretty quick growth for us. So cryptocurrencies uh, have to have some level of value for there to be adoption, just like anything else. What's in it for me? And it's not always going to be with cryptocurrency, what is it for me as the consumer? It might also be what's in it for me as a merchant. So there's all parties involved have to have some level of value or see some level of value in the solution. So uh, these will morph over time. I think crypto's early. Yesterday we had a panel that talked about some of the legal ramifications of crypto, how there's still a lot of regulation that needs to happen. Uh, so if we look at these though, th there are some, some key values that we can take away uh, minimizing risk of fraud, 24-7 tracking of payments, um, more power in your hands. And it's not, in this case, I would say it's both parties to the transaction, right? We're cutting out the middleman. Now I am taking value I have and I'm giving it directly to you. Quicker transactions. Now, just recently, I'd say Bitcoin transactions at the point of purchase have gotten down into sort of the the EMV speed uh, before they were pretty pretty long. Um, 
but what this really talks about though is from me giving you money to you getting that money, right? So there are a lot of other payment methods out there where maybe it takes a day, maybe it takes two days, maybe it's as much as three days for those funds to get to you. And then finally, uh, cryptocurrencies are available to everybody. So it's really easy. Do I have to go to an ATM? No, if I have a phone and I have access to the internet, I have access to cryptocurrency. So what is another market pressure? Um, Facebook, love it or hate it, right? They're coming out with, with Libra, right? And Facebook has an entire community of people from all walks of life, both banked and unbanked, um, that, that they have access to. You know, and with that, the beauty of crypto is that there's sort of a democratization of, of money uh, globally. So if I have a crypto unit here in the US, it's the same in Singapore. Um, it takes about the same amount of money to transfer that. I have about the same access to it. So wherever I am, I have access to a, a global unit of money that's the same. Um, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and LiveMint, also globally accessible. Uh, but what we're seeing, of course, with Bitcoin, I just mentioned, people, people are actually treating that more like a security or an investment than actually a method of payment. So with uh, NCR Silver, and you may have seen our solution in the expo this week, uh, we actually have APIs that could provide an interface to allow a merchant to take Bitcoin. We're working on one that's going to support Ethereum. We have zero merchants using that solution today, right? So there's nobody using it through us. But as we saw with the heat map, we know there are merchants out there. And very likely, merchants are using non-integrated forms uh, of solutions to handle uh, cryptocurrency transactions. It's not going through a point of sale like ours. But what we think is um, having those sorts of things available to a small business um, gets them set up for being able to take these currencies uh, when they come. Uh, one other thing to say about, uh, this is more about Facebook, sorry. So uh, about Libra, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of Facebook, right? But it's also a governing body. And so we have Visa, MasterCard, uh, PayPal, several folks are part of that body. We also have financial institutions joining. Now there's no Bank of America yet, and there's no Wells Fargo, right? There's nobody big name like that. But there, are, there are financial institutions that are part of this governing body. And really the hope there is that you could look at Libra and say, this is, has the potential to be a cryptocurrency that's used for transactions, not just let me see if the value is going to go up and I'm going to sit on it and trade it. So for crypto to become a more popular payment option among the masses, we really need a vehicle that will um, make it pervasively available, right? So here, I was just talking about Libra, which let's say that's, that's part of a social media platform. Uh, certainly, there's a solution called Brave out there that's a web browser that they've now added a, an Ethereum e-wallet to. Um, there are things like WeChat, right? So these all, all these platforms are moving towards uh, cryptocurrency as a way of transacting business, right? So somebody wants to be that platform, that marketplace where these transactions will occur. All right, uh, consumers. So, and this is a very busy slide. Uh, this gets at something the panel discussed about the differences between things happening in China, per se, or internationally versus what we're seeing for payments in the US. But <clears throat> at least uh, China, largest adopter of mobile wallet payments, they went straight to the phone, not so much plastic. Here in the US, we still love our credit cards. It still usually is the most frictionless way for me to pay. A lot of that has to do with, and I think this was also mentioned uh, just a moment ago, has to do with us not having contactless in our credit cards. Like in the UK, 
everybody can just tap that plastic and go. You don't have to bring out a phone. You don't have to check your battery. You don't have to launch an app. It is very frictionless. Uh, so that's something that we'll, we'll need to uh, overcome. And maybe, again, that plastic is tied back to cryptocurrency. Or maybe you know we, we do something else besides NFC. But um, definitely adoption here is, is probably lower due to some of those things, but still growing. And I think these sorts of uh, payment technologies also grow at a faster pace now. So if, you, um, if I go to the hometown favorite, um, if you remember back to when McDonald's didn't take credit cards, nobody needs to raise their hand and date themselves like I'm doing. Uh, but we know, right? They, they didn't take credit cards. And, it, and then now, if you think back, well, when did McDonald's not take NFC? That was very, very recently. So we've already seen things like tap and, and credit and things starting to accelerate with these acceptance of new ways to pay. So what, what's that, where does that leave us, right? If we're, the, if we're the technology experts, we're the solution providers, um, we need to inform ourselves, we need to understand what cryptocurrency is, how it's provided, how it's transacted, how it's going to be governed. That's going to be huge, right? There's a lot of gray area there right now. Uh, and be consultative. So we look at, uh, for example, in our point of sale sales process, we want to be more, uh, at least be consulting with them as much as we're selling to a merchant. All right, this is it. So to close, I'd like to reiter re <laughs> reiterate, sorry, I'm trying to go so fast, I can see the clock. Um, consumer payment preferences are shifting, right? Um, crypto's becoming more mainstream, and in order for this to happen, we need to stay, in stay informed, be consultative, and deliver solutions that will help streamline. Thank you.